Apexes are a new variation of monster introduced in Monster Hunter Rise. They are alternate versions of normal monsters with many differences. They are bigger than their standard counterparts, darker, and covered in scars. They have new attacks and are some of the hardest challenges Rise has to offer. As cool as the fights are, Apex monsters leave a lot to be desired and fail to truly live up to their potential. In this video I will explain some of the problems they have, how they fail to meet standards set by previous games, and how the problems could be fixed in Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak. But first, a word from our sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. Raid Shadow Legends is celebrating its third birthday this month. That's right, three years old. It's consistently been one of the top RPGs out there. The game started strong from the very beginning and never slowed down, with the developers working hard to constantly add new content and game modes every couple of months. Some of the new additions the game has received have really spiced things up, such as the Doom Tower, a game mode with 120 levels, each with their own new and terrifying bosses to kill, providing fantastic challenges for seasoned players. Since the very beginning, Raid has had huge amounts of character and boss variety, but that has not stopped them from adding more and more. It's crazy how dozens and dozens of champions later, each design is still incredibly unique. Last year, Raid added a whole new faction, the Shadowkin. They're a tribe of warriors from the Far East, and are, in my opinion, easily one of the coolest looking factions in the game. We also got to discuss the Hydra, the newest and deadliest addition to Raid. The monster has multiple heads, each with a different ability requiring a different strategy. The craziest bit is that if you sever his head, another grows to replace it. The Hydra is a challenging boss, but gives some of the best artifacts in the entire game. Raid Shadow Legends is a fantastic game for all player types. It's great for casual players, as well as people who just want to dive in and play it hardcore. It's no surprise it's been going for 3 years now, and I fully expect it to go on for several more. It truly is the gift that keeps on giving. And so, I invite you all to download Raid Shadow Legends using the link below. As said before, Raid is approaching its 3rd year anniversary, and they're doing a ton to celebrate it. Free gifts for everyone, as well as new content and events. We are talking new champions, new artifacts, and even a personalised video showcasing every Raid player's own journey and personal achievements. In fact, the whole month is packed with special events and tournaments with some of Raid's best prizes ever on offer, including champions, lots of shards, and tons of other stuff. This is definitely the best time to start playing if you aren't already. If you hit the link in the description, or scan the QR code on your screen, you'll receive a huge birthday package worth $40, which is honestly just huge. Keep in mind, this bonus will only be available to claim for 30 days, and it's exclusive to new players. However, existing players can still treat themselves to something good. Both they and new players can enter the promo code 3 years raid to get a bunch of free gifts worth over $25. All they have to do is enter the promo code before the 14th of May. It's that easy. Click the link in the description, enter the promo code, and I'll see you all in Raid Shadow Legends. The Apex Monsters were initially the final boss of a new quest type introduced in the game, the Rampage. In these quests, you had to repel hordes of monsters and stop them from breaching a gate. These monsters ranged from your average Rathian or Zenoga, but they could also be the Elder Dragon, Wind Serpent, Ibushi, or an Apex Monster. Killing the final monster ended the Rampage, and you would be rewarded with Defender Tickets, materials from the monsters you had repelled, as well as materials from the Apex monsters. In terms of plot, they were created by Wind Serpent Ibushi when they were caught up in one of his storms. The power of the storms mysteriously enhanced them, and upon surviving it, they came out darkened and scarred, with the ability to create their own rampages. At launch, there were only three Apexes, Azuras, Rathian, and Mizutsune. They could only be fought in rampages, which had a fairly mixed reception. So while the Apexes were fun to fight, many players did not want to slog through rampages in order to face them. 
This was rectified with the launch of the first title update. It not only introduced Apex Diablos and Rathalos, but also normal quests for Apexes already in the game. The second title update brought in Apex Zenoga along with quests for him, Diablos and Rathalos. These normal quests were great for people who wanted their materials without playing Rampages. The final hub quest of Rise has you go up against an Apex Mizutsune, Rathalos and Zenoga back to back. Later on, they would be featured in event quests with higher difficulty and extra rewards. Apex Azura has got his own quest, Apex Mizu and Zenoga appeared together in a double quest, Apex Rathalos and Rathian were paired up, and we received a quest with two Apex Diablos. Later there was an endurance quest featuring an Apex Azuras, Rathian and Diablos. Around October onwards, extremely hard Apex event quests began releasing, known as the Emergency Apex quests. In these quests, the monsters would have heavily inflated damage, making them the hardest challenges in the game. The rewards were Defender Ticket 9s, which were the highest reward for completing post-game rampages. Having them obtainable through event quests gave players a way to use them without playing rampages if they didn't wish to. As of the game's final pre-Sunbreak content update, you can battle the Apex monsters either in rampages or on a variety of different maps at varying difficulties. They're fairly tough not only for their difficult attacks and how they differ from their base forms, but also because they cannot be wyvern ridden. Despite this, they're still very enjoyable to fight. That is the current state of the Apex monsters in Monster Hunter Rise. They do certain things well, such as providing a fun challenge. However, they fall short in many, many other aspects. First, let's discuss the elephant in the room. Apex monsters have absolutely zero gear to craft, no individual armour or weapons. Well actually that's wrong, they have a single weapon per type, known as the Rampage weapons. You craft and upgrade them using defender tickets and Apex parts, and they can be customised in a variety of different ways. The weapon's elements, attack power, sharpness, and more depending on what weapon you're using can all be adjusted based on the user's needs. Visually, they're just Kimura weapons, but as of update 3.0, you can layer them to look like any weapon you desire. But as it stands, the Apexes have no gear of their own. I cannot hunt an Apex Mizutsune to make Apex Mizutsune armour, because it doesn't exist. The draw of Monster Hunter comes from not only fighting monsters, but using their parts to make armour and weapons to fight even stronger monsters. Grinding for gear often takes time, but once it's done, your achievement is reflected in your appearance. Your weapon reflects the monster you've spent hours killing and mastering both visually and functionally. Same with your armour. This makes playing the game incredibly satisfying as you move on and on to new challenges and master more of the game, while your physical appearance represents the time you put in to make the set. Apex monsters having basically nothing to craft goes against this completely. And so unless you want to make the Rampage weapons, which can range from amazing to bad based on weapon type, you have absolutely no reason to fight them. Sure, there's the fun of it, but making the monster's gear is half the reward. Let's compare Zenoga with Apex Zenoga on my Rise Switch file. I fought so many Zenogas in Rise, but despite me finding Apex more fun, I fought him significantly less. Why is this? It's because I sought out Zenoga's weapons and armour. I crafted his low and high rank sets, made several of his weapons and upgraded them to the maximum. Meanwhile, I only ever fought Apex Zenoga for the fun of it, or if I needed a Rampage weapon, which isn't very often. The result of this is that the standard Zenoga has been fought a lot more, despite me actually enjoying Apex more. If this Apex Zenoga had gear, I'd be much more willing to fight him, not only for the fun and the danger, but also because I knew I'd be getting some cool looking armour from it. Not having any gear to craft makes fighting these monsters relatively pointless and makes them stand out poorly from the rest of the game. Every other monster in this game has something to craft from them, even the small monsters like Ranopolos. Apex is having no gear is simply a baffling decision on so many levels. 
The Apex monsters all have a consistent visual theme. They are covered in scars and are a much darker colour. The reason they are covered in scars is because they were caught directly in a storm caused by Wind Serpent Ibushi and managed to survive. However, this doesn't explain how exactly they got their unique powers. What exactly was it about this storm that gave Apex Rathalos his enhanced fire attacks? What about it gave Apex Diablos all these unique attacks? There's no reasonable explanation for it. They all share the same design theme of having a darker colour and scars, which would be fine on its own. However, Rise has no subspecies currently, meaning the Apexes are pretty much the only monster variations. Other games would have Pink Rathian, Black Diablos, Azor Rathalos, and it would make the cast of monsters visually distinct. The Apex monsters all look very similar to each other, which makes them somewhat of a poor substitute. In addition to this, the designs themselves are not very different to the base forms. They are all simple texture swaps of the base forms with no actual physical differences. This complaint in particular might sound a bit weird, but it will all make sense later. So, within Monster Hunter Rise alone, these are the biggest issues. However, the issues with the Apex monsters go beyond Rise. To see how bad they truly are, we must explore outside of the game and look to the rest of the series. Another major problem with the Apex monsters is not only that they are poorly implemented in Rise itself, but they also fail to meet standards set by previous Monster Hunter games. The Monster Hunter series is constantly building upon itself. Mechanics are introduced and refined across each game and generation, becoming better and better over time. The Rise Apex monsters seem to be inspired by several things from previous games, but they simply do not live up to their predecessors. In this section of the video, we will explore what inspired the Apex monsters in Rise, how previous games executed their concept better, and where Apex Monsters fell short in comparison. For the past several months, I've been making videos where I explore how individual monsters changed throughout each game, as well as any variations they received over the years. Monsters usually gain variants and subspecies, but Monster Hunter Generations has a new special type of variant known as a Deviant. Deviants are monsters who went through some very specific circumstances and became stronger as a result. While your average subspecies is designed to cover a monster's weakness or put a spin on them with a different element, Deviants are designed to emphasise a monster's strengths. Dread King Rathalos has incredibly potent fireballs and can fly for extended periods of time. Dread Queen Rathian has enhanced poison and can spread it with her tail. Thunderlord Zenoga is permanently charged and is capable of uber-charged thunder attacks. They are also very uniquely designed. Dread King has a different wing design and large dorsal spikes, which helps sell his enhanced flight abilities. Dread Queen appears to have poison infected through her whole body, which explains why she can spread so much of it. Thunderlord seems to have a genetic mutation that allows him to store more thunder within his body, along with other side effects like an overgrown horn and oversized claws. My favourite deviant is Bloodbath Diablos. His backstory is that he survived a battle with hunters and suffered injuries, namely his horn being shattered. However, he learnt from the battle and was able to take down countless other hunters and monsters, and this is reflected in his fight, where he often takes advantage of people expecting a normal Diablos battle roaring and then immediately charging so that he can skewer those who were stunned by his roar, or charging and stopping to stab hunters who preemptively dodged. The Deviants have unique designs and movesets that are fully intertwined with their ecology. We know how they receive their unique abilities, whether it be through diets and habitat, genetic mutation, or an incredibly unique set of circumstances. Some Deviants have really cool origins, such as the Rust Razor Senator, discovering the skull of a Glavinus and using it to sharpen his claws. If you've seen my evolution videos, you probably know where this is going, but I'll give everyone else the short version. In terms of fight, the Apex monsters are almost identical to the Deviants. There's a couple differences here and there, 
but they mostly fight the exact same. Same attacks, same gimmicks, and in the case of Apex Zenoga, same appearance. So what are the differences between the Apexes and the Deviants? And what puts one over the other? Well, while the quality of the backstories is subjective, the sheer variety of the Deviants' backstories and how it relates to their designs and movesets makes them a lot more memorable. For example, we know that Bloodbath Diablos has unique attacks because he survived battles from hunters, but what exactly about Ibushi's storm caused Apex Diablos to learn them? Even if the Apex monsters are visually different, they just have their textures changed, while the Deviants usually have more physical differences with the model itself. But the biggest thing that puts the Deviants above the Apex monsters is that the Deviants have actual gear to craft. Each Deviant monster has their own armor set and multiple weapons for the player to obtain. This gear has no decoration slots, but is often very powerful. For example, Bloodbath Diablos' set has attack up large, evasion plus 2, and a skill called Composed, which raises the charge rate of your hunter arts. Dread King Rathalos' armor gives full earplugs, tenderizer, and attack up large. Each deviant weapon can recharge your hunter arts faster than normal too. Because the deviant monsters have actual gear, you have way more reasons to fight them. I enjoy fighting Bloodbath and Apex Diablos. The two are almost identical after all. But Bloodbath's armor set and weapons were highly desirable for me, and so I fought him much more. Yes, he's a lot of fun, but challenging too. But the gear he had served as a practical reward for me overcoming his challenges, as it gave me a new armor set and weapons that I still use in GU to this day. The Apex monsters have no armor and no weapons except for the Rampage Tree, which itself is unsatisfying, because its base design is simply a recolor of the basic Kimura weapons. Unlike every other weapon forged from monster parts, it does not reflect the monster I fought at all. As a result of this, there is very little reason to fight them. To reiterate, the armor and weapons you can craft from monsters is the visual and functional representation of the time you put in fighting them again and again. You not only look like the monster you've been pounding into the dirt, you also have boosted abilities from the armor skills as well as the weapon. Those who grinded any deviant or to be honest any monster gets to experience this. But the apex monsters? Not at all. The deviant monsters each had their own questline, with multiple stages. Each quest would unlock the next and would give you a ticket with a corresponding number you could use to upgrade your gear. For example, let's look at the Bloodbath questline. G1. Hunt a Bloodbath Diablos. G2. Capture a Bloodbath Diablos with no feints allowed. G3. Hunt a Diablos and a Bloodbath Diablos. G4. Hunt a Bloodbath Diablos and a Hyper Seregios. G5. Slay two Bloodbath Diablos in a boss arena known as Ingle Isle. G6. EX. Slay Bloodbath Diablos. Each quest increases the difficulty gradually, which makes upgrading the gear a bit of a challenge, but results in some very powerful equipment by the time you are finished. The final quest, EX, is not mandatory for upgrading anything, but it features a large, extremely powerful deviant that does massive damage per attack. Defeating it is tough, but unlocks a special armor pigment related to the deviant you slayed, as well as the ability to layer the deviant's armor. I myself only have blood baths because I enjoy fighting him the most, but as you can see, the game is rewarding the player for taking on massive challenges, not even just through gear, but special armor pigments impossible to get anywhere else. Now why am I bringing up the quest system? It's because as cool as the Deviants were, they had a lot of problems. For one, whenever a group would complete a Deviant quest, it would only count as complete for the person who hosted it. So everyone in the group would have to individually host it in order to access the next quest, meaning a group of four would be doing each quest four times. This also applies to the final EX quest, meaning to claim the special pigment, a group of four would have to complete that quest four individual times to claim the reward for everyone. This is kind of bad, but not awful, because there are only six deviant quests, 
so that's only 24 quests minimum for the party. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. Deviants introduced with the expansion only have 6 quests, but base game Deviants had 10 quests initially and were given 6 more in the expansion. The result of this is that Deviants like Dread Queen, Silverwind and Grimclaw, essentially any individual Deviant from the base game, will require a party of 4 to do 64 total quests to complete. The quests are scaled for multiplayer, so completing them solo takes longer than it should. And that's not to mention how the ticket system pads out the process. Each Deviant has their own numbered tickets. For example, Dread Queen Rathian gives Dread Queen 1 ticket if you do her first quest, Dread Queen 3 ticket if you do her third, etc. One ticket is required to upgrade any piece of gear. While on higher level Deviant quests you can obtain tickets from lower levels, you're only truly guaranteed tickets from their respective level. Beating the Deviants is one thing, but obtaining at the very least their armour, that's a whole other grind. Now you have to complete each quest multiple times, not only to ensure each party member can level up, but to upgrade your gear with tickets as well. If you're solo, you will probably end up doing a single generation's Deviant up to 64 times if you want a fully upgraded set, and that's not even talking about the weapons. The generation's Deviants are especially long, because you have to upgrade their weapons and armour all the way to G-Rank individually. The game does not let you simply craft the G-Rank versions once you are able to. Can you all see why Bloodbath is the only one I have grinded to completion now? Okay, so this video is about the Apex monsters in Monstance Arise. You may be wondering why exactly it's relevant to the Deviant system with all its flaws and benefits. Monstance games always build upon each other, taking criticisms of the previous game systems, fixing flaws and putting new spins on them. The Deviants were an evolution of the guild quests in 4 Ultimate, a system where you could receive a quest for a monster and level it up over time. The higher the level, the stronger the monster's attack power would be, capping off at 140. You could obtain powerful but random weapons through this. The problem with the system was that it was very RNG dependent, with the method of obtaining quests as well as their rewards being random. Generations evolved the idea of having a quest you could level up with the Deviants by having monsters you fight be much more unique, locking very powerful but craftable weapons behind it, and finding ways to make the system less reliant on RNG. The Deviant system had its own problems, but we could expect the next game in the series to try its own system, fixing the flaws of the previous one, right? And that's where the Rise Apex monsters fall short. They utterly fail to build upon and improve the previous systems. There is no special system or special gear to obtain. You do your rampages, you fight the Apexes, and you're done. The fifth generation of Monster Hunter made a universal change so that completing any quest will complete it for everyone involved, including urgent quests. It also introduced health scaling so that monster health dynamically lowers or increases based on the number of players. This means that players can now solo quests that would be intended for multiplayer, but can also play with others without the monsters dying too quickly. If Rise had copied the Deviant system, which for the record I'm not saying it should have, these two basic changes would have drastically improved it. It would have made the grind much less padded for both solo and group players. Had Rise gone on to streamline the ticket system, and maybe even allow players to craft the G-Rank gear in Sunbreak, it would have made the system incredible. Again, I'm not saying Rise should have outright copied it, but if the Rise developers had designed a new grind for the game involving the Apex monsters, taking lessons from the shortcomings of guild quests as well as the Deviants, they could have come up with something even better and improved. As it stands now, Apex monsters have the moveset of the Deviants, but they lack most of what made them good and improve little of what made them bad. Monster Hunter World's story revolved around Elder Dragon migration, and so they play a big part in the game. World has an enhanced state for monsters, where they can become tempered, which increases their damage and makes them shinier, but also grants the player more quest rewards. Many months after World's launch, new, enhanced, arch-tempered monsters started being released. These were Elder Dragons with enhanced traits and new attacks. For example, Arch-Tempered Teostra is incredibly strong, 
and has the ability to quickly create explosions beneath his wings. It is worth mentioning, the difference between an Elder Dragon and their Arch Tempered form is smaller than a normal monster in Rise and their Apex form. Why am I drawing comparisons between Apex monsters and Arch Tempered monsters? Because around the same time frame Arch Tempered monsters were released for World, the Emergency Apex event quests were being released for Rise, that being several months after the release of each respective game. These were some of the toughest challenges of their respective games, but there is another reason I am comparing them. Arch Tempered Monsters launched with their own armor sets. That's right, beating Arch Tempered Koshala will let you craft a brand new alternate Koshala set, same with any other Arch Tempered Elder. Apex monsters in the base game have no armor, and the Emergency Apex monsters simply give extra Defender Ticket 9s. I must reiterate once again, the reasons Apex monsters suck and disappointed so many people is not only because they are poorly implemented in Monster Hunter Rise, not only because they fail to build upon any previous Monster Hunter systems, but also because they don't even meet the standards set by previous Monster Hunter games. If World's powerful variants of monsters were able to have their own special reward, why would you not have something for the Apexes? If you watched my evolution videos, specifically Xenurgo, Tigrex and Diablos, you will know that 4 Ultimate has its own Apex monsters. Rise, for some reason, reused the exact same name, which is like, guys come on, could you really not think of anything else? How about Alpha monsters, Rampaging monsters, so many other words that haven't been used before. The result of this is that the series now has two Apex Diabloses and Xenogas, and come Sunbreak, we'll probably end up having another Apex Tigrex. I would love to discuss the 4 Ultimate Apex monsters more, however I spent way too long talking about the Deviants, so we shall save this topic for another time. So we have looked into why the Apex monsters suck within Monster Hunter Rise, but we have not looked into why. That is to say, why did the developers make them this way? How did they drop the ball so hard? Keep in mind, what I am about to say is part fact, part speculation. To understand, we have to look into Rise's development. We don't know much, but what we do know is that they started work in 2016, and development was going steady until 2018. Up until then, Rise was going to have segmented maps with loading zones, just like the older games. After the success of Monster Hunter World, they decided to go with open maps. This was said very casually in an interview, but when you stop to think about it, you kind of realise how monumental of a change that is. Considering how Rise is now, with the wirebugs, palamutes, open maps, wall running, and how they all work together, they must have had to alter, introduce, and scrap a lot of things in order to make that change. It would pretty much be a huge design reboot. That was only three years or so before release, and so the decision to switch to open maps must have taken a lot of work. Then in 2020, disaster struck with the pandemic, which in the game industry caused countless delays. Monster Hunter Rise was surely affected too. Later in 2020, there was the Capcom ransomware hack, where a lot of data was ransomed from Capcom and then released. Data breaches usually cause everything to stop in order to discover the source of the breach, meaning they lost valuable development time. This is all speculation on my part, but it definitely seems to me like they ran out of time to give the Apex monsters more. Rise's rocky development can be seen even in the final product, with the entirety of the post-game being released as updates. Assuming the pandemic didn't happen, it's entirely possible the Apex monsters at the very least would have had their own armor sets, if not more. Let's keep this brief, Apex monsters can still be fixed in Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak. I doubt they can reach their full potential, but they can still be very good within the game. At the time I am writing this video, Sunbreak is only a couple months away, so whatever decisions made about the Apex monsters have probably already happened. It's probably too late to suggest anything, but it's still worth brainstorming new ideas. Armor sets are a must, and the bare minimum. We need a natural reason to fight them, beyond the fun of it. 
it will add more set variety and make the apexes feel like they actually have a place in the game. Weapons in my opinion are not as necessary, but would still be a nice bonus. A good idea could be to reuse Monster Hunter World's beta designs for Xenogre, Rathian, Rathalos and Diablos and recolour them to match the apex colours. Another change I've sort of floated around in an older video is making them invasion monsters. Invaders are monsters that come into your quests with the purpose of interrupting your hunts. They are usually challenging and force you to change priorities. Devil Joe is the most infamous invader, but Rise has Basil Goose and Rajang. However, these two and Rise suffer from some issues. Rajang steeps whenever he's an invader, so he's barely a threat, and they can both be Wyvern ridden, which effectively turns them into weapons the player can use against the target monster. To get a better understanding as to why Apex monsters suck in Rise, I recommend you watch this video by Superrad on the topic, where he goes into much more depth. The video made me realise that Wyvern riding, trivialising invaders, was a pretty big problem. Now here's the thing, Apex monsters cannot be Wyvern ridden at all. They simply break free of the bugs and the fight continues. Now collectively, the Apexes can be spread across every map. Diablos takes the desert, while the others take the Shrine Ruins, Frost Islands, Flooded Forest and the Lava Caverns. They are also much tougher than the standard monsters, so in my eyes they seem like the perfect candidates to become invaders in Sunbreak. You could even tie in their lore with the gameplay. What if they invaded your quest and their roar powered up the monster you are fighting, and unless you repel them, your target will remain permanently buffed up for the remainder of the quest. This would make them challenging and create a sense of urgency. With all this, I don't think you'd even need to make a long grindy system. Just as long as the Apex monsters have gear to craft and other roles within the game, they all feel like worthy additions. It is worth mentioning that as far as we know, the Apexes could be a one and done thing. They might not even return for Sunbreak, just like arch tempered monsters in World. If that happens, then it will be a missed opportunity in my opinion. The Apex monsters are poorly implemented in Monster Hunter Rise. They have no gear to craft, they lack interesting designs, and they fail to build upon the Monster Hunter series in any meaningful way. They can be improved in Sunbreak by not only letting us craft armour and weapons from them, but having them act as invading monsters. They cannot be Wyvern ridden, and lore wise they have huge impacts on other monsters. All this, in addition to their challenging nature, can make them much more threatening than the current invaders in Rise. If that happens, perhaps they can finally meet their potential as Apex Monsters. Thank you for watching this video. I've wanted to extensively discuss the Apex Monsters for a very long time. In fact, it was one of the first videos I ever wanted to make, but it was simply too big of a project. Making the evolution videos and discussing the Apex monsters there made me want to revisit the idea, so I got to work and this is the result. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any thoughts on the topic, I would love to hear them in the comments. Be sure to check out my other videos and have a good day.